Well, hello and good evening and welcome to the University of Houston School of Art. I'm glad you could join us. Tonight, we're coming to you live via Zoom and the UH School of Art YouTube channel. I'm Beckham Dossett, Director of the School of Art. And tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Julia Guernsey, the second of six distinguished guests who will be joining us over the next several months as part of our annual speaker series. Our next event is coming up quickly. Next Thursday, November 18th, we welcome artist Candice Lynn, whose current solo exhibition, Seeping, Rotting, Resting, Weeping, is on view at the Walker Art Center until January 2nd. And that event will also be on Zoom and YouTube. Then on February 24th, we'll be in Dudley Recital Hall on the University of Houston campus, where we will welcome graphic designer Ramon Tejada, whose hybrid design teaching practice pract focuses on collaboration, inclusion, unearthing, and the responsible expansion, expansion of design, a practice he calls puncturing. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor of Art History, Dr. Rex Koontz. Thank you. Thank you, Beckham. I would like to begin by noting that the University of Houston occupies the ancestral unceded lands of the Karankara, Okisa, and the Sana, and the Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas has lived nearby since the 18th century. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Julia Guernsey to the University of Houston School of Art in the Catherine G. McGovern College of the Arts. Dr. Guernsey is the DJ Sibley Family Centennial Faculty Fellow in Prehistoric Art at the University of Texas at Austin. I will not list Professor Guernsey's publications. The list is long and impressive. I do want to stress that over the last 15 years, Professor Guernsey is the sole author of three key volumes in the history of art of ancient Mesoamerica, or that area of indigenous American civilization that extends from North Central Mexico through Guatemala and Belize to parts of Honduras and El Salvador. In each of these volumes, Professor Guernsey has carved out important new ways of thinking about the meanings encoded in ancient Mesoamerican objects, culminating, in my opinion, in her most recent book, Human Figuration and Fragmentation in Preclassic Mesoamerica, From Figurines to Sculpture, published last year by Cambridge. Tonight, we will be treated to certain key themes in that book. Dr. Guernsey reminds us that the last 200 years has not been the only time that art was used to upend the viewer's previously held assumptions and expectations. The author insists, as several have before her, that a revolution in visual culture centered on the depiction of the human body occurred about 3,000 years ago on the Mexican Gulf Coast. She goes further than any previous scholar, however, when she argues that the rolling effects of this revolution eventually transformed all areas of visual culture, from monumental stone sculpture to small ceramic figurines. Such a dynamic view of indigenous American visual culture and its history, as well as the seriousness with which she treats the arts of common farmers in relation to elites is both innovative and deeply important. In addition to reminding us that others outside Western culture have been astounded by new artistic visions, there is another key element lurking in Guernsey's practice that we would all do well to consider and even emulate. As we will see, the scholar looks closely at objects and declines to fall into aporia when the close looking refuses to yield obvious answers. Most of Guernsey's material was made more than 2,500 years ago in a place, southern Mexico and Guatemala, that had not yet developed a writing system. Guernsey's objects have no contemporary texts that would guide us towards the object's meaning. So much art history wants and even needs such contemporary texts, such magic words to produce meaning. And yet here we have no words, only the objects themselves. Uh, 
The objects are our major and sometimes only witnesses to the cultures that created them. Guernsey's is an art history that must fully face this fact by facing the object. Failure is not an option in that the object and its material context are the fundamental pieces of evidence for this episode of human creativity. Without efforts such as hers, we would have to appreciate the irony of an art history that, when called on to be the main venue for exploring a culture, can only hesitate and doubt in the absence of texts. In her most recent work, Professor Guernsey reflects on the closely observed and does not hesitate. Without further ado, I give you Professor Julia Guernsey. Thank you so much, Rex, for that very generous introduction. It, I am delighted and it's, it's a very um, uh, big honor to uh, be giving this lecture as a part of the visiting lecture series. Um, and I wanna thank the University of Houston School of Art and especially Rex, whom I have known since our days as graduate students. And I'm gonna now share my screen. Okay. I'm gonna start this lecture with a question. Why on earth is a pre-Columbianist speaking in a lecture series dedicated to contemporary art, criticism and design? The answer is I will argue is that it can be very productive to think about pre-Columbian art and more recent art together. We can understand both better, I think, by stepping outside of our disciplinary and temporal boxes. What you are looking at is actually not pre-Columbian art. It's Louise Bourgeois' Welcoming Hands, a sculpture that takes as its point of departure fragmentary body parts. Bourgeois used these fragmentary body parts to investigate emotional states, ideas of the body drawn from Freudian psychoanalysis, the complex relationships between object and subject, and even the interface between sculpture and civic action. Welcoming Hands is one of her works classified as a part object, a term used to designate works by modern and contemporary artists that often take the form of isolated body parts or disembodied limbs. Welcoming Hands, however, did not always elicit the artist's intended response. One version of the work installed in New York's, uh, New York's Battery Park City, not far from the Statue of Liberty, was intended to evoke a tender sense of welcome. However, its placement nearby the Museum of Jewish History invoked for some viewers a grim reminder of the severed body parts of death camps. This object is pre-Columbian. It was carved around 1200 BCE by ancient Olmec artisans out of a multi-ton stone boulder. It's as engaged with fragmentary body parts as bourgeois welcoming hands, although no modern scholar has ever applied the term part object to it. But I'm willing to bet the ancient artists who created it might have appreciated the term, which is something I want to explore in this talk. Olmec sculpture is fascinating. When Olmec artists began creating it in the second millennium BCE, it quite literally came out of nowhere. By that, I mean that there was no gradual crescendo of Olmec sculpture in which it started small and tentative and gradually became monumental and increasingly expressive. When it emerged, it was already big and visually powerful and engaged with impressively naturalistic human representation. It was also fully engaged with bodily fragmentation and as a result, reliant upon the conceptual acts of completion that we as viewers understand to make sense of isolated body parts. With this Olmec colossal head, we are invited into a conceptual act of completion. We understand the head as alluding to a complete and fully formed human being. This art must have been shockingly modern in its day. We greatly limit ourselves, not to mention ancient Mesoamerican artists, if we overlook the sheer modernity 
the avant-garde nature of this art in 1200 BCE. Nothing like it had ever been created before in the Americas. It was new, it was monumental, and it was loaded with meanings about the nature of humanity, even in a fragmentary state. But monumental stone sculpture like the Olmec head on the left didn't exist in isolation. There was also a robust tradition of small, handheld, fired ceramic figurines, like this one you see on the right, which also played with ideas of human representation and bodily fragmentation. There are key differences, though, between these two objects beyond the obvious ones of materiality and scale. The figurine on the right once possessed a complete lower body, which was deliberately, I believe, broken off at some point in the ancient past. The colossal head, on the other hand, was conceived as just a head. It never possessed a lower body. In many ways then, the monumental Olmec head is not unlike bourgeois welcoming hands. Both take their meanings from isolated body parts whose connections to complete bodies were only ever implied. They are both complete even if engaged with fragmentation. The fig figurine head at the far right, on the other hand, was once attached to a body. It's a fragment that is no longer complete. I want to think as we move through this talk about body parts and fragments and what they tell us about the worlds in which they were created. But I also want to acknowledge from the outset that they are not and never were all doing the same thing. In other words, this talk is not about establishing false equivalencies between modern and ancient art or intimating that Louise Bourgeois art is just like Olmec art. What it's about is how by looking and thinking across space and time and mediums and cultures, we can start to more fully appreciate the expressive and conceptually diverse potentials of bodily fragmentation in art. Let's start with a brief geographical and temporal orientation. Mesoamerica refers to a region that runs from this portion of central Mexico down through the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, up here into the Yucatan Peninsula. It encompasses Guatemala, Belize, and then these Western portions here of Honduras and El Salvador. I'm gonna focus on the pre-classic period or the years spanning 1800 BCE to CE 250. I'll frequently mention the site of La Blanca, which you see right down here, where I've been working for the last 17 years. And I'll also show you quite a bit of Olmec art, most of which comes from this region up here along the Gulf of Mexico. Mesoamerican art is full of representations of human bodies. And when we look at Olmec art, which you see here, or Maya art for that matter, we quickly discern an emphasis on naturalistic human forms. But this naturalism was tempered by concerns that went beyond the human. Gods and other supernatural beings also took human form, as with this Olmec sculpture that merges human and supernatural attributes, including a snarling feline mouth. Such attributes communicated an identity that exceeded the merely human. An emphasis on naturalistically rendered human bodies also pervades the corpus of ceramic figurines, as in this example from La Blanca, which dates to about 900 BCE and is less than 10 centimeters tall. Figurines, like their stone counterparts, also engaged with ontological boundaries or the frontiers between the human and the divine. With this La Blanca figurine that you see here of ceramic, a decidedly fleshy human body replete with a navel tapers abruptly terminating in this strange bird-like head. The renowned classic scholar Mary Beard once quipped that Greek art means bodies, but you never hear the same thing being said for ancient Mesoamerica, in spite of the fact that it is equally engaged with human representation. On my more pessimistic days, 
I fear that my field has not gained much traction since the days of James Stefanoff, who created this watercolor in 1845, titled An Assemblage of Works of Art from the Earliest Period to the Time of Phidias. It's mostly figural art in Stefanoff's image, and if you can get past the rather overwhelming emphasis on the classical traditions of ancient Greece, you'll see there are actually a few pre-Columbian objects, all Maya, relegated to the very bottom of the composition, and you see them right here and again over here. In 1845, Stefanoff was saying more or less the same thing that Mary Beard said two years ago, that it's Greek art that means bodies. Even if we credit Stefanoff for at least including pre-Columbian art in his homage to the Western world, we should note that he deals mostly with the monumental. He is concerned primarily with stone sculpture and little mention is made of the millions of small scale objects from around the globe that were equally engaged with human representation. There's no room, in other words, for the Venus of Willendorf in Stefanoff's image. But we can learn a great deal when we put sculpture and figurines, art and archeology, span the ancient and the modern, figuration and fragmentation into closer dialogue with each other. Across pre-classic Mesoamerica, socially constructed understandings of the human body were visualized in a number of ways. There's a consistent emphasis on the head as the focal part of the body. Faces reveal subtle modeling. At times, eyes were rendered as closed as if to clearly indicate the absence of sight. In the case of this monument from Monte Alto, which dates to around 300 BCE, it is an ancestral figure that lacks sight and is portrayed in death. But it was actually preceded by about 600 years by these small ceramic heads here lined up in a drawer, which reveal the same emphasis on closed and heavy uh, closed eyes and heavy, almost jowly facial features. The sculpture at the left was always just a head. It never had or necessitated a corresponding body. The figurines, however, in the drawer on the right, once had bodies attached to them before they were snapped off. There are about 10 of these monumental heads from the site of Monte Alto that share these very distinct facial features. By contrast, we have found hundreds of these ceramic figurines whose same features predate the stone head by centuries. I want to underscore just how abundant ceramic figurines were in the early and middle pre-classic periods. Where I work at the site of La Blanca, we have found well over 5,000 figurines to date. At other contemporaneous sites, the number exceeds 8,000. In this same era, stone sculpture, like the Olmec head you see at the right, was far, far rarer. Only a handful of sites had a significant corpus of stone sculpture during the early and middle preclassic periods. But most had hundreds, if not thousands, of human representations in the form of ceramic figurines. This point is worth emphasizing. In this era, Human representations in the form of these small ceramic figurines were abundant and widely accessible and used by both elites and commoners. Everyone across the socioeconomic spectrum would have had access to these small ceramic figurines. The same can't be said of stone sculpture. It was an elite privilege. Only elites could commission and erect stone sculpture. If you focus only on monumental stone works, then it's easy, although entirely incorrect, to conclude that representational devices for conveying animate images of human beings were the achievement of ruling elites and most fully expressed in stone sculpture. A very prominent art historian from an Ivy League institution who shall remain unnamed, wrote in 2005, that the ability to render naturalistically the likeness of a human constituted, and I quote, a form of mysterious and miraculous knowledge, and therefore also a form of power. 
Such power belonged to the ruler and his circle and was not available to others, unquote. That's just flat out wrong, 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 wrong. You can only arrive at this conclusion by completely overlooking the medium of clay and the many thousands of pre-classic figurines, which were just as engaged in rendering naturalistic human beings, were doing it far more frequently and to boot often earlier than stone sculpture. So what do we know about human representation in ancient Mesoamerica? And how do we know it? We don't have much writing during the pre-classic period as Rex noted in his introduction. The hieroglyphic inscriptions are few and not well deciphered. So they're really not much help in understanding how ancient Mesoamericans perceived human representation in that era. However, by the classic period or after about 400 CE, we have lengthy and fully deciphered hieroglyphic inscriptions from the Maya region. A number of epigraphers or experts in hieroglyphic writing have demonstrated that for Mesoamericans, representations were more than just representations. They were the extendable essences of the person portrayed. And by that, what they were um, basically saying is that the qualities of the self that were present in a living, breathing human body also extended to representations of that individual. Or stated differently, representations of people shared an ontological domain or a domain of being with their living, breathing counterparts. This Olmec sculpture that you see here uh, that dates to around 1200 BCE and portrays an elite individual clapping, clasping a scepter of authority. And there you see the scepter would have been understood as imbued with the same ontological dynamism as, or spirit as its living, breathing human counterpart. Given this, it is surprising, at least at first glance, that human forms focused on communicating living and vital bodies became the target of systematic destruction or fragmentation. And yet, very early in the Mesoamerican sequence, there is evidence that objects were often deliberately broken or decapitated, as is the case here with this sculpture. Almost 50 years ago now, scholars posited that, acts, that such acts of destruction were not simply due to the ravages of time, nor were they indicative of revolution or iconoclastic acts of breakage. Instead, the mutilation and fragmentation were evidence of symbolic behavior. An example from the middle pre-classic site of Chalkatsingo illustrates this point well. Monument 16, which you see here at the left, which portrays a seated individual, was beheaded in the ancient past in the same manner as the monument that I just showed you. The missing head of this monument was never recovered. A different monument from Chalkatsingo, Monument 17, and here at the right, you get two different views of it, illustrates the opposite thing. It consists of a head whose corresponding body was never found. Even more interestingly, this carved head was interred in a burial beneath a structure at Chalkatsingo. As one of my Mesoamerican colleagues put it, the placement of Monument 17 in a burial mirrored the placement of an actual human body in the grave. The archeological record holds other important clues. Ceramic figurines could also serve as proxies for actual human bodies. At the middle pre-classic site of Cajalpech in Belize, a decapitated human body down in this corner was laid in a crypt associated with this structure platform B at the site. Adjacent to the burial of the human body, a single bowl held a human skull. Mirroring this fragmentation of the actual human body down in this corner were two figurines in the um, two other corners of the building. At the Northwest corner up here was a figurine head missing its lower body. At the Northeast corner, was a figurine body that was missing its head. Now, it's not unusual to encounter fragmentary human remains when excavating in ancient Mesoamerica. 
Throughout ancient Mesoamerica, skulls or bones were often removed from burials in order to be passed down through generations by descendants. The dissemination of a deceased individual's bones enabled the essence of that individual to also spread. I wanna show you some imagery to back these ideas up. Here on a classic period carved stone monument, you see the monument, the complete stela here at the left. We see a powerful Maya queen clasping here a royal scepter that upon close inspection, and you can see this in the detail, reveals itself to be an oversized human femur or bone. The emblem of authority, in other words, is in fact a disembodied body part, perhaps that of her ancestor, here enlarged for dramatic effect. Pieces of bodies, here a series of legs carved of jadeite, were also featured as jewelry in ancient Mesoamerica. Jade was a luxury item, and in this, ne this necklace would have been worn by a very powerful Olmec individual who moved through the world with a presumably intact human body decorated with artistically rendered bodily fragments. Now, of course, these ideas of bodily fragmentation are not unique to Mesoamerica. They find parallels in other parts of the world as in the Christian cult of relics in which body parts of deceased saints were preserved and revered. Carolyn Walker Bynum in her discussion of this phenomenon in medieval and Renaissance Europe noted that bodily division was fundamental to Christianity of the time. And it wasn't just for saints. Nobles sometimes requested dismemberment upon death so that they could be interred in multiple locations near the remains of different saints. In death, they could be in more than one place at the same time. So let's return to our pre-classic objects and think a bit more about what the archeology span can tell us about bodily fragmentation, why context matters, and why art historians like myself benefit greatly from thinking about human representation and its corollary fragmentation in multidisciplinary and multimodal ways. I've been working at the archeological site of La Blanca, Guatemala for nearly two decades. And in that time of the more than 5,000 figurines we found, only two are nearly complete or mostly unbroken. And you see one of them here on the right. In this example, the figurines missing only a single arm. However, most look more like what you see on the left here miscellaneous fragmentary body parts that include heads, like you see here, limbs, there's a nice arm and a hand, torsos, um, there's another limb and arm with a bent elbow, even feet and legs. The photo on the left shows one level or single layer of an excavation unit at La Blanca. We lay out our square excavation units and then carefully excavate downwards, inch by inch, so that we can keep track of what comes out of each consecutive layer. I could show you rather repetitive slides of each excavation layer, but I won't, since what comes out of them looks more or less the same in each level. It's a mishmash of body parts from different figurines. And what we also rec recognize is that this mishmash of different figurines, like you see here in this example, were all gathered or tossed into the same location, even though none of the body fragments attaches to any of the other fragments near it. In fact, it is nearly impossible to match one figurine fragment with another, even when investigators spend many hours attempting to do so. And I speak from experience here. Disembodied heads, like these that you see up here, never attached to the torsos, like, like this one here, that you see um, in association with them, nor do the severed arms or legs reattach to adjacent torsos. It's as if the fragments of any single figurine migrated off in different unknown directions. Here you see an example of another figurine from La Blanca, where one of the limbs, this elegantly bent leg that you see here is still attached to the torso, although it's missing its lower calf and foot. 
the other leg here um, is completely missing. And what you see here is a lump of clay that I've used to stand it up for the photo. Um, all the other figurines, limbs and its head have been snapped off and none of the missing body parts were found in association with this figurine. The figurine displays particularly subtle modeling. You see a fleshy stomach um, complete with another navel and a lively posture as if perhaps the figure were dancing. Certainly with ceramic figurines, the weakness of joints directly contributed to processes of fragmentation, intentional or otherwise. And a viewer could be forgiven for thinking that the fragmentation seen here is the result of natural processes of use and wear, which it sometimes was. But the archeological evidence suggests otherwise in many cases. It indicates that figurines were deliberately broken and then the various body parts were dispersed in some way so that the body parts of a single figurine don't wind up in the same place. As a student of mine once said, figurines hardened into ceramic through the firing process perfectly mirror the human body's capacity for strength, but they just as readily capture the fact that the human body is leavened by vulnerability. Human bodies, like ceramic figurines, are simultaneously durable and brittle. In fact, we consistently encounter breakage in figurines where they are not intrinsically as weak. And as you can discern in these examples, it sometimes would have taken considerable elf effort to carefully break off a, a single limb or a head. The object at the far left, you can see it's missing its head and it's missing both of its arms, was severed across the base of its thick torso, which would have been the structurally strongest part of it and the most difficult to crack uh, carefully. The stout legs of the central figurine were snapped off very carefully at the sockets. The exa example here on the right is even more interesting. The front of the torso here was meticulously sheared off and the head and lower limbs also removed, but the, but the arms were retained. We see the same careful fragmentation of figurine heads at La Blanca as well. In these two cases, the heads were bisected down the middle, which was no mean feat to pull off. And I probably should remind you all at this point, there's no, there was no use of metal in this era. There, was no, there were no metal instruments or implements that people could have used. So this would all have been done by cracking the rock against other cracked rocks, which explains why I'm arguing that this would have been done very, very carefully. This physical evidence of deliberate breakage begs the question of just what was going on. A number of scholars have argued that the fragmentation of middle preclassic figurines demonstrated an understanding of the human body as partable or divisible. What the archaeology tells us is that the fragments were then distributed, albeit in ways we don't understand. All that we know is that the pieces of a once complete figurine didn't remain together in one place. So how do we think about, about body partability and the circulation of human body parts? How do we explain fragmented bodies, whether actual human bodies or of stone or of clay? Theories of enchainment as introduced by Marilyn Strathern provide one explanatory framework. Enchainment theory hinges on an understanding of fragmentation as a vehicle through which social relationships could be symbolized and negotiated. A simple idea illustrates the idea, or a simple example illustrates the idea. Consider an object that is deliberately fragmented into two or more pieces. Here I'm showing you medieval European chirographs, which were contracts between two parties. The contract, once agreed upon, was carefully cut down the middle with a jagged line and each party was given half of the document. Those halves, which fit perfectly back together again, served as symbols of the contract and the social bonds formed by it. Each person with a half or a fragment of the once original whole shared in the social contract. 
And as I always remind my students, these are not just ancient ideas. They are fully present in our modern moment as the best friend's necklace, half of which you retain and half the other half of which goes to that special someone, reminds us. With pre-classic figurines, the destruction of an object's visual and corporeal integrity and the distribution of its constituent parts to other people may have materialized similar social networks. But we don't actually need fancy enchainment theory to make sense of all of this. What makes better sense for Mesoamerica is to consider other emic, internal, explanatory frang frang or, uh, frameworks, excuse me, that hinge on the relationship between figuration and fragmentation. Sometimes, as I've already noted, fragmentary objects were considered complete in and of themselves. It's misleading to even call them fragmentary. That is certainly the case with Olmec colossal heads or massive stone heads like this one from the site of Monte Alto, which never possessed a corresponding body. Objects such as this engage with synecdoche, another fancy word that captures a very straightforward concept. The part invokes the whole. In this case, the head alone invokes an entire human body. Deliberate acts of breakage carried similar but distinct meanings. Once a representational object was dismembered or beheaded, it didn't lose its ontological power. It and its pieces maintained their potency. There is some irony here. Meanings do not reside only in an object's original and pristine state. Even pieces of representations retained their potency. Sometimes those pieces were incorporated into buildings or burials or ceremonial deposits. At other times, especially with figurines, they were eventually just swept away and discarded with other debris from everyday life. Regardless of their eventual fate, what we do know is that fragments were not left to just lie around. They were powerful and one needed to attend to them. How else can we think about this? In Maya hieroglyphic writing systems, the knob sign, which is this hieroglyph here that's formed with this disembodied human hand, designates a unit of measurement. So this example on the, on the left, it dates to about the ninth century CE and is providing a unit of measurement that equals nine. And in Maya hieroglyphic writing systems, the bar stood for the number five, and then each dot was a one. So you get five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this unit of measurement here, nine knobs. We can trace similar conventions through the 16th century, as in the case of this Aztec manuscript that you see on the right. Here, disembodied human hands serve as standard units of measure in the mapping out of a property's boundaries. And here's the property in red. Inside the structure, disembodied human heads tell us about the occupants. In Mayan languages, the word for person, winik, also means 20 and refers to our 20 digits, our 10 fingers on our, our fingers on our hands and our 10 toes on our feet. This number 20, which is so fundamental to personhood, also had calendrical significance. The Mesoamerican calendar consists of 13 months, each of which ha had 20 days. We can see this, or we can see these concepts expressed in classic Maya hieroglyphic writing. At the top of this image, we see here the glyph for Winique functioning calendrically and marked with the numeral nine, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, it, we read it as nine Winique. Uh, just as we would understand today to be the 11th of November. Below the same Winik glyph that we see here functioning calendrically serves as the word for person. What's important to understand here is that people are, in a Mesoamerican worldview, inextricably linked to calendrical time. Individual persons were just one tiny component in larger cycles of time. And like time itself, people could be broken down 
into smaller units or constituent parts. There are additional um, implications for personhood, or especially calendrical implications, I should say. For some Mesoamericans, an individual's general character and fortune in life depended upon the day in the calendar on which one was born. One's destiny, in other words, was determined calendrically. We also know that some Mesoamericans believed that one's destiny also decreed one's physical characteristics. Hence, people born on the same day shared physical features as well as similar destinies. I think these notions are reflected in pre-classic figurines already by at least 900 BCE. We find dozens and sometimes even hundreds of stock characters like these puffy faced ones I showed you previously. Perhaps these figurines found scattered across the ancient city of La Blanca were utilized by people all born on the same day and who shared a similar destiny. In the Mayan language of Kakchikel, the word for destiny is vach, which also means face. I know I've gotten down into the weeds a bit here, but what I'm really trying to say is that representations mattered in ancient Mesoamerica. They were loaded with meanings that extended beyond the objects themselves and engaged with understandings of personhood, structures of time, and social relationships. They engaged in their own tumultuous and modern world with what it meant to be. These ideas help us make sense not only of systems of bodily representation, but also systems of bodily fragmentation. Again, as epigraphers have demonstrated, hieroglyphic texts make it very clear that people were the sum of their individual parts. Glyphs for body parts, including heads, hands, toes, and torsos, often include what epigraphers refer to as circles of severance. These circles highlighted in yellow on the slide mark the point where the body part would have articulated with the rest of the body. So even though these are individual hieroglyphic characters that you see here, they're conceptualized as three-dimensional body parts. So for example, with these two hands at the top, the circles of severance here and here mark where the hand would have attached to a wrist. Here in the lower left, a circle of severance marks the waist above a lower body and legs. At the lower right, we see a chest with pendulous breasts. And the circle of severance here marks the place where a neck would have connected this torso to a head. These circles of severance that we see in later Mesoamerican writing systems harken back, in my opinion, to ideas that were articulated centuries earlier in sculptural form, in stone, clay, and probably other materials. We don't see circles of severance on the ceramic figurines. Instead, we see the actual acts of severance. And the pla places where figurines are often severed, at the necks between torsos and heads, at wrists and at knees, and across chests or at legs, correspond uncannily with the places that later writing systems also emphasize. I would go so far as to suggest that these script traditions developed from ancient ideas that were first conceptualized, not only with regards to the real human bodies, but also with, in regards to sculpture or three-dimensional objects, which were then translated into graphic form. We eventually see these ideas play out in the domain of stone sculpture from later eras. This is an enormous and complex boulder monument from the site of Bilbao in Guatemala, which is almost impossible to read here in this photo. So I've included a drawing of it here on the right. And what I hope you'll see is that scattered across the surface of the monument is a series of disembodied body parts. You've got a torso here, you've got another torso here, another one down here, you've got legs. Here you have another leg, here's a bent arm and the upper arm, and there's a disembodied head. As my colleague uh, Oswaldo Chinchilla recognized, several of the body parts are marked with circles of severance. 
just as we saw in the hieroglyphic script traditions. And here's a good example of this torso marked clearly with a circle of severance and another one down here. With this monument, sculpt with this sculpture, representational idioms and textual idioms have been collapsed. It's the culmination of millennia of ideas concerning both bodily representation and bodily fragmentation. So let's refer, return to one of the images with which we began. From the very inception of Mesoamerican civilization, artists and artisans were engaged with representation and with bodily partability and with synecdoche in which a part represents the whole. But we can and should think even more deeply about these issues. With the colossal Olmec heads, we are dealing with what might best be termed representational absence. In representational absence, key features, in this case, an entire body, have been omitted from the representation. And yet we as viewers complete the imagery. We connect the heads to their bodies, even if they were never actually there. These same acts of conceptual completion were also fundamental to the compositions of Edouard Manet at the end of the 19th century. Manet was greatly influenced by photography. And in this work here on the right edge of the painting, we see this gentleman's body, which is abruptly bisected or truncated. And in this painting, we see Manet playing with framing devices that abruptly cut off or sever bodies. Linda Nochlin, in her book, The Body in Pieces, The Fragment as a Metaphor for Modernity, called attention to Manet's often unsettling use of cropped figures. She pointed to yet another truncated figure in this painting, the calves and tiny little green boots of a trapeze artist in the upper left corner of the composition. They're barely noticeable yet, once you do notice them, quite jarring in their strangely off-center location. They allude to a complete person whose face we will never know. For Nochlin, Manet's images were about the meaningless flow of modernity, which had no narrative beginning, middle, or end. They were also about the alienation and violence towards women in Paris at this time. The modern period was ushered in by the French Revolution, Nochlin argued, and the imagery of truncated body parts was infused with memories of the guillotine. The body, and the female body in particular, were, was not always and only an object of desire, but also a site of suffering, pain, and death. In Manet's painting, the disembodied feet operate synecdochically with the part representing the whole. By imagining and completing the body, viewers situate the trapeze artist in the temporal world, in a modern world of narrative time. For Nochlin, these images captured modernity, but her modernity was a Western one, beholden to the enlightenment. The fragmentation here is both like and very unlike the bodily fragmentation we find in Mesoamerica. Nevertheless, the Manet painting makes me think of the way we often encounter bodily fragments in the field. Here's a photo here of one of the vertical walls of one of our deep excavation units at La Blanca. And the arrow here points to this tiny little object that pokes out of the wall. And you see the object here enlarged in this detail. It's a tiny human foot, a small fragment that even in its broken state, conjures up an entire individual whose complete form we will never know. It's as jarring as Manet's painting. Once upon a time, fragmentary bodies in Mesoamerica were radically new and provocative, as thoroughly avant-garde or modern as Manet was in the 19th century. The artists that sculpted or modeled these representations were playing with synecdoche, with time and with human beings' places in society and with the tensions between objects and subjects every bit as much as Manet or Louise Bourgeois. For Mesoamericans, 
acts of figural representation and fragmentation engaged in complex ways with explorations of personhood or what it meant to be both as an individual and as part of a larger community. Ancient Mesoamericans were clearly concerned with individuals. The sheer quantities of carved and modeled bodies, many unique, prove that. But the individual for ancient Mesoamericans was balanced by a concern for the individual, an understanding of the divisibility of each person, the recognition that people were the sum of their, undivid of their individual parts. Ancient Mesoamericans, I think, would have understood the idea of part object, even if their understandings were linked to very different worlds and very different modernities. Fragmented body parts for ancient Mesoamericans never meant only one thing, yet their suite of associations were always anchored in an understanding of the human body as partable and embedded in society. When we excavate these tiny body parts, or even the monumental ones made of stone, we are digging up the physical evidence of these once very modern understandings of what it meant to be human, to engage with the world, to express social relationships as well as personal identity, and give them form through processes of representation and fragmentation. In many ways, time collapses upon itself in these archeological processes of recovery and investigation. Where I work on the Pacific coast, the ravages of the Guatemalan Civil War, which lasted from 1960 to 1996, and had catastrophic events on indigenous peoples are only indirectly present. But not far away amidst the bucolic valleys and peaks of the Guatemalan highlands, where the war was particularly horrific, time collapses upon itself in painful ways. A colleague of mine, herself of Maya descent, excavates in this region. But as she does so, she not only, re not only recovers the bodily fragments of ancient sculpture and figurines, but also the body parts of the desaparecidos, the modern Maya who were tortured, killed, and disappeared or disposed of in shallow graves during the Civil War. Nachlin's ideas of body parts as symbolic of suffering and death are more than academic in parts of Guatemala. We should think carefully about what fragmented bodies symbolized in the ancient past, but also what they mean in the modern realities of the 21st century. Fragmented bodies resonate very differently for indigenous populations who faced atro atrocious acts of genocide. They speak to both an ancient past and a modern reality. Whether in the highlands of modern Guatemala or in Battery Park City in New York, bodily fragments are imbued with and inspire a spectrum of social meanings. So to wrap this up, in ancient Mesoamerica, people from all walks of life utilized objects to give physical form to existential questions. For us today, these objects speak volumes about corporeal wholeness and corporeal partability, about modernities both past and present, and of the power of bodily representation and its corollary fragmentation to capture understandings of human relatedness and social existence. For artists ancient and modern, bodily fragmentation was and still is both a reality and a rhetorical strategy, contingent upon context, never static, and always open to interpretation. Ancient Mesoamericans' unique understandings of bodily partability transpired, however, without the Enlightenment, without Freudian psychoanalysis, without Manet and Linda Nochlin and even Louise Bourgeois, who nevertheless were engaged with equally fraught modernities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia, for a talk that was both stimulating and it towards the end also extremely important in opening up 
the idea that the indigenous peoples that we're talking about are still here. They are still interacting with both their own cultures and cultures that they really have very little control over. Um, we have questions already popping up, but I would like to uh, remind or inform our audience that if you're on Zoom, the Q&A is the place to go. If you're on YouTube, it's called the live chat. We are monitoring both of these for questions. Uh, we, we have one from a colleague, uh, Dr. Haran, Natalie Haran. Uh, I wonder if Natalie would like to unmute herself and ask the question, if indeed she can, or maybe she can't. And can I, can I do that? This, this is something that maybe I should have thought about earlier. I would oh, love to. She oh, she's here. We got her. Excellent. You got me? Okay. I wasn't prepared to be on camera. Um, You're not. But, You're just voice. Okay, thank you. Just thank voice. You. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Guernsey. That was so fascinating. Um, I'm a scholar of fluxus, so very far afield, but I was um, really struck by the circles of severance that you highlighted in the writing. And I was also noticing um, in the small sculptural fragments in particular, it seemed like there was a kind of emphasis on the bodily orifices of the mouth and the eyes and the ears. And I was wondering if you had anything to say about a correspondence there um, or what are your thoughts between um, a relationship between the circles of severance and how orifices um, are depicted in sculpture? That's a great question. Um, and I, I do have some thoughts on it. We had a, um, a graduate student who um, did some work with us at LeBlanca a few years ago. And one, she didn't work on the whole corpus of figurines because it's unwieldy, right? It's over 5,000. But what she was able to determine with the corpus that she worked with, which was several hundreds, um, was that there really does seem to be a striking correlation and that in that when figurines are painted, they're never painted in a realistic way. You know, they don't have like ruby red lips and, um, you know, skin tones that the paint seems to be symbolically applied. And it's often applied either on the head, marking the head is kind of the most important part of the body, but also at the joints. Um, and oftentimes the red paint is kind of sloppily applied over the mouth, not again, like it's like they're trying to color in lips, but almost as if they're calling attention to that orifice. And then in later um, mural paintings, not that from, from a later period, we actually see some of these same, um, same uh, joints and um, points of juncture um, with, with body parts that are emphasized. So there's something there. We haven't, we haven't nailed it down yet. And, um, it's just an impression at this point, but I think there's something to that. So Julia, because a lot of us are really interested in the creative aspects of scholarship, I want to call our audience's attention to the fact that those figurine fragments that you show were for many, many decades, and when I started, used mainly to date the strata that you're getting them from, right? They're, they're used as a sort of scientific remnant that one can then create a chronology around. For me, even when I was reading your work in its earlier stages, it was hard for me to shift from these things as important chronological markers to things that are meaningful in a constellation of visual culture that a lot of us really hadn't even imagined yet. Could you give us a little bit more of the personal journey from, you know, maybe you never saw them as chronological markers as the rest of us did, to this incredibly rich and sophisticated vision of how these figurine fragments actually participated in the larger visual culture? Um, sure, that's another, um, that's a big question. So one thing I didn't make clear, or maybe I did, is um, most of these figurine fragments have been buried since about 900 BCE. <laughs> and so um, they're always pretty eroded. Um, and so when we get kind of remains of paint, that's pretty spectacular. Um, and so, but we don't, so 
and, and like Rex is saying, we utilize them along with ceramics. So ceramics are the, the main way archaeologists archeolo date things. That with each kind of level or stratigraphic layer, people pull out the pottery and they use the pottery. And when the pottery changes or the figurines change in style, we know we're looking at a, at a different time period. Um, figurines were always only of sort of... Um, marginal interest, it seems to me, to archaeologists and art historians. Um, few art historians look at figurines because they write them off as some, you know, they're, they're not necessarily beautiful. They're, they're ceramic and not stone. They're not monumental. They're fragmentary. Um, and archaeologists look at them, I think, much the way you indicated, Rex, as just a way to help date things. Um, when I went down, I actually went down to La Blanca thinking we would find monumental sculpture. I really hoped to find monumental sculpture um, and we didn't find any. Um, well, we found a few things, um, but it was certainly not enough to um, warrant a study. And so mostly out of frustration, I turned to the figurines because we had, you know, 5,000 of them. But for me, I had never looked at figurines and I'd never thought about small scale objects and I never thought about ceramic you know, objects that were molded rather than carved of stone. Um, and so for, even though I, I knew like one side of me was saying, look at the figurines, that's, that's where your data is. That's where you can, the other half of me was saying, no, I'm afraid of figurines. You know, they're making, they're forcing me to think about things I've never thought about before. And so with time um, and the process of photographing each one of these, I mean, it's, it's such a tedious um, process and we take, you know, multiple views of each fragment. Um, you begin to think about them. You're forced to think about them. And so that's really how it happened. That to me is fascinating. And we're going to continue with some questions in just a moment from our audience. But that, that idea that just spending time with something and you, you can't get away from it, a sort of almost meditative questioning that one has to engage in if one spends time with objects like that has allowed you to really break um, a scholarly mold is something that is of no small importance, I think, to a lot of us. And and just this is a complete and shameless uh, advertisement for one of the things that's going on next semester is Dr. Guernsey will be joining us in the object lab talking about what one can do with objects, including our large collection of ceramic uh fragments, including figurines as well for our graduate students. So stay tuned, graduate students. I know you're out there. Uh, that is one of the things we're going to be doing next semester. So again, shameless blog rolling, I guess. But um, we, we have an interesting question because it has to do with the, the scholarship. A, a, a studio graduate student really enjoyed the parallels between Maya and Manet. And she wanted to know a little bit more about the scholarly background that you have drawn on to make that, that analogy and to bring that into some sort of focused relation. So I, um, it would be, a, it would lie. It would be a lie if I told you that that was actually my idea. Um, one of the things that I um, did was start reading everything I could about figurines. And the most robust literature on figurines is not in Mesoamerica, it's in Neolithic um, Europe. And so I read, um, you know, volumes of, of work, of the work being done on Neolithic figurines. And there's this one um, book and study and several articles by a man by the name of Douglas Bailey. And he um, has worked extensively with figurines. And he was the one who actually um, happened to pick up a copy of, of Nochlin's, um book and all of a sudden realized um, those correlations. So I'm really borrowing from some of his ideas there in that part of my talk, um, and then using them to think about Mesoamerican figurines. Excellent. We have time for one more question. I think if someone is either on YouTube, I'm looking at that, or? There's a good question in the Q&A panel, if that, oh, but it's, let's do it's it. from one of Beckham Dossett's various uh, alter egos. So if you wanted to speak your question, you could raise your hand and I would allow you to, or I would make it so yes. that you could talk. There we go. Can 
Okay. Hi, this is Jillian Conrad. I'm one of the sculpture oh. faculty. Thank you so much for your for your talk. I loved hearing it. it's everything you have to say. And and just um a, a little detail in sculpture today, we have a, a visiting artist also from UT Austin who was also talking about bodily fragments and fragmentation. <laughs> it's really been a theme. Uh, who is that? Um Aaron Cunningham, who ah, okay. Yeah, who casts metal and, and was showing us her work and her work also deals with the body and fragmentation. So oh, that's excellent. <laughs> um, so one of the questions I had, I was really fascinated by thinking, and maybe you said it and I missed it, but uh, especially at the lar- with the large scale heads, um, how they, if you have any understanding of how they originally related to the landscape, were they just sitting in the landscape upright or were they um, horizontal? Did they have some kind of pedestal? Or, yeah, or that, that's another great question. So first of all, um, the Olmec heads that I showed you, the ones from San Lorenzo, those were actually, um, we think that these massive stone boulders were hauled in from many kilometers away, 30 to 60 kilometers. I can't remember the, the number off the top of my head. Um, probably floated in by rafts is our best guess since moving them through this landscape. They come from these volcanic um, hills not far um, from the Gulf Coast, but they had to be then moved to the very flat kind of sea level environment of San Lorenzo. And people's best guess is that they floated them in on rafts and then carved them in um, in elite palaces. And we've got really good archeological evidence that's Ann Cyphers who um, excavates San Lorenzo is able to demonstrate that the stone carving um, workshops were actually physically attached to the ruler's palaces. So we've got this really clear correlation between getting that stone, these huge boulders, and then uh, carving it was an elite prerogative. Um, What we then know is that, or our assumption is that there's about, um, I think it's 11 of these heads at the site of of San Lorenzo. And our best guess is they represent rulers. And each of them is a little bit individualized. Um, They don't appear to have been um, set up on any sort of platform, um, but the the archeological evidence suggests that, that they were kind of rimmed the perimeter of the site and especially the elite precinct. Um, and what they might have been is sort of a you know portrait gallery of the most powerful rulers at San Lorenzo, and um, who were memorialized in these um, in this you know massive monumental way. Um, at other sites, when we see these monumental heads, they're usually also erected either um, in um, in the kind of ceremonial centers of sites. In one case, a more unusual case, the head um, is, uh, was positioned at a, uh, a high mountain pass between two key regions. And there again, it might've been serving almost as a marker of now you're entering our territory. But our understanding of them is definitely that they were, they, they kind of form, they were you know, orchestrated in, in tandem with the landscape um, and probably marked significant points of transition, especially into, you know, powerful elite precincts. Thank you. Thanks again, Julia. And oh, my pleasure. We want to give you a more general thanks for a really wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. We look forward to seeing you in a kind of part two of our relationship in close observation of objects next semester. We'll be, we'll be finding exact dates and everything a little later, uh, but that is going to happen next semester. And I personally look very forward uh, to the workshops at the Object Lab and our other events there. So until then, take good care of yourself. Thanks everyone for coming. Beckham, did you want to... Um, give us a goodbye yes from the school of art uh yeah thank you well again thanks everybody and thank you so much julia that was fabulous um we look forward to seeing you again uh hopefully next week uh when we welcome candace lynn um take care everyone and have a great evening night thanks everyone